begin our service this evening with the Brethren Hymnal, number 25. Number 25.
136.
welcome you to the service this evening, those that are watching or listening in as well, and we're glad that you are taking time for this service. We've been uh, blessed, I believe, this week. Good sermons. Um, easy to, to get a hold of and to challenge us and to put into practice, hopefully, and uh, uh, Brother Dustin's been bringing God's Word to us, and not only in the sermons, but the children's stories. Um, I know that's a lot. Uh, continue to remember him uh, through the remainder of this week as we plan to gather each evening at 7. Um, it was quite a prayer we sang, number 130. And if you look at those words, though to be like thee in all the different things it mentions, it's quite a challenge. Lowly in spirit, uh, full of compassion, forgiving. It's a, a lifetime of learning to be like our Lord Jesus in that way, isn't it? Ongoing and a challenge each day. Um, very glad to have Brother Ron uh, Copenhaver with us. Before. I do need to say this, that last evening, um, Evelyn Veach made it known that she wanted to accept Christ as her Savior and Lord, and we are thankful for that and uh, give the Lord praise and certainly want to encourage her as well as her parents, uh, Andrew and Abby. But we're glad to have Brother Ron with us tonight uh, from White Oak Congregation. I know it means a lot when you're the minister to have ministers from your own congregation come and support you, and he has agreed to have our opening at this time. Well, it is good to uh, see each one of you here, and um, do want to say uh, from the brothers and sisters of White Oak, we just really appreciate our, our sister congregations. and. Um, I think there's just a lot of strength in, in uh, just knowing we have congregations that we can just fellowship with, and so um, we praise the Lord for, for you all. Um, I'm, I'm sure you've been, been uh, well fed with Brother Dustin. I appreciate Dustin and his family. Um, as, as you listen to Dustin, uh, you'll notice that I think God has given Dustin just an extra dose of of wisdom in, uh, in difficult um, situations. And uh, um, so he is, Dustin, and has been just a real, real blessing to our, our ministry team there at, at White Oak. The uh, title tonight is Family as God Intended the Church. And if you would take your Bibles and turn to John 15, 12 to 17. And um, if you a verse stuck out to me there, 16, uh, talking about the church. But I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, that your fruit should also remain. And as we're thinking of, of the church, uh, we're ordained. We are called to, um, this is something you need to do. A church needs to, you're ordained to, to bring fruit. And uh, so this is going to be, uh, we, we need to listen to, to see what this, this fruit is, is going to be here. So let's listen intently as we read God's word. John 15, starting with verse 12. This is my commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what the Lord doeth, but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you, that ye love one another. It's pretty clear what um, this fruit that the uh, Lord has been talking about, loving one another. This time, let's, let's kneel for prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight. Indeed, it's a privilege to be come to your to gather together with with uh, uh, this body of believers to worship you. 
to learn more about you, to, to uh, surround the word and to look in the word and to, with expectation. Father, tonight we just pray that this would be a, a special time as we look in your word. Be with our brother, Brother Dustin, as he, he shares the word with us. And Father, we pray as we look at your word, we know your word is all powerful and strength and strong and speaks to us and alive. And Father, tonight we pray that you would speak to our hearts and the Holy Spirit would, would uh, just burn in our hearts and, and, um, and we would be able to learn. Father, we want to be, uh, be a church. We want to be a people. We want to be your children that just bring glory to you. Father, it is our desire that we would bring forth fruit that, that would um, be good fruit. We want to have fruit that is, that is uh, uh, fruit that is producing not only in, in numbers, but, but in, in just quality. And Father, as we're thinking about love tonight, as your scripture was telling us about love, and, and uh, Father, help us to... to uh, um, be able to love a little more than what we have before. Mm -hmm. Father, we ask for your spirit to just uh, speak to us tonight, strengthen us. Father, I pray a blessing on this congregation and as they are here in this community, just spreading the light. And Father, as, as our desire as we produce fruit, that those around in this community can, can see the fruit that we have through, through Jesus Christ. Father, may, may your word go forth tonight. Continue to give Dustin and Gloria just, just strength. Father, just uh, pray a, a blessing upon him. And uh, may he be able to share the word in a mighty way. Father, we just want to thank you and love you for all what you have done. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to say thank you again for Brother Ron for coming out to support us and the other ministers from White Oak, and but most of all for all of you for your kind attention and prayer support. Different ones sent texts and emails saying they're praying for us, and we really appreciate that. Certainly all of your uh, snacks and meals, uh, those are appreciated as well. We feel very, very humbled and very blessed. Um, and I echo Ron's thoughts, you know, we, uh, we do feel... Um, a kinship with all of you and uh, it's just it's just a good feeling to have brothers and sisters that we can share together in this way I think of uh, as we talk about the family of God that the church family there's a lot of different things we could say and there's there's um, you know I think about it, it's funny how we and maybe you're different than me but I, I, I tend to think of before COVID and since COVID, it somehow that, that 2020 is this, is this date that you just don't forget. Um, you know, we had, uh, I'll still remember, I guess it was the end of January, sometime early February, we're still as a congregation trying to figure out what we're doing here with a shutdown and how we're going to have church and things were a little bit in flux. And then we had revivals coming up then in March and I think it was the first time we had revival services over Zoom and that was a little different. And uh, it, that worked for a time, and I know you did some things over YouTube, and that was a blessing as well. But, you know, it was good when brothers and sisters could get come together again in person and fellowship together. It's just something uh, unique about that. And uh, we certainly want those that are listening and watching online to uh, feel a blessing too. But, you know, we're grateful the ones that could be here in person. There's just a, a kinship and a fellowship with that. But, you know, as I think back towards COVID and... Uh, you know, I remember listening to some radio, I don't know where I was, somebody was talking on the radio about, you know, that this, is, is, are the shutdowns so bad, you know. For those of us that consider ourselves introverts, you know, this is great, you know, we get to stay at home and, and uh, don't have to interact with people. And, but somehow this, this idea of isolation, of social distancing, you know, before that, social distancing was something that was kind of pejorative, you know, that, that somebody that couldn't, relate well with people, but that became the, the rule. And uh, you know, so things got lost. There were some folks struggling through all that. 
and it turned out not to be so healthy, uh, as, a, as a society at least, for us to isolate. There was something missing. There was a hunger to connect with real people, uh, other people in, in real time and in, in a real place. You know, we need to re- renew and redefine our sense of belonging at every stage of life, early childhood, adolescence, adulthood, and in later years. And I think sometimes we often get a sense of belonging or not belonging based on how well we think we fit in. No one wants to be the oddball that everyone laughs at behind their back. And I can say with fair amount of certainty that everyone here tonight, including myself, has felt excluded at one time or another. We felt on the outside looking in. And so you feel like an oddball when that sense of connection is broken. Community was God's idea. He created us as people that, that look for community. And the enemy would love to convince as many people as possible that they're different. As such, they don't belong. And once that sense of community is broken, he has more lies like, you aren't worth anything. You aren't any good. You, can't, you don't contribute anything. You know, these problems that our society has, that our communities have, didn't just start during COVID. But some of the symptoms began to, to surface. And so, how do we look at this as believers? And in light of what Brother Ron read and some other scriptures, you know, we find our identity and our purpose, first and foremost, in the fact that we're image bearers of God, but even more wonderfully, those of us that are part of his kingdom, children of God, part of his family. And while the enemy would try to convince us that our differences should drive us apart, nothing can be further from the truth. Our differences create this interdependence, this beauty. And uh, in God's eyes, that, that diversity that we have is not by accident. It's the point. It's the whole point. There are many different ways we go about this, talk about this. Um, but this evening we're going to focus on the church family, as I said. And so how do we find a sense of community within a church family? And, and there's, again, a lot of different ways we go with that. But we're going to focus a, a little bit on spiritual gifts tonight. And I know that many of us understand spiritual gifts. And hopefully many of you know what your spiritual gift is. Hopefully all of you know what your spiritual gift is. Um, I had preached a similar message to this at White Oak uh, last year, and I would gotten some brothers and sisters in the congregation to come up and sing in a chorus. And you know, a chorus sounds a lot better when you have four parts than it does when we're all singing and singing the melody together. You know, when, when we blend our voices uh, and bring out our unique gifts, it's, it's so much more beautiful. You know, those of us that are bass don't need to pretend we're tenors and we don't need to pretend we're sopranos. There's a sense of community within a chorus. A sense of identity, belonging, even though each member is different. So too in the family of God, each brother and sister in, the congregation, in this congregation has at least one spiritual gift. You may possess several, but generally there's one that comes to the top. You know, God could have created us with, with all the gifts in equal measure. He could have. But God's model isn't about self-sufficiency. It's about working together and depending on each other. And that, that's why the analogy of the body, um, the Apostle Paul talks about that in, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we're going to read that in a little bit. But that's why this is such a good analogy. A body cannot be without the whole of its members. The church body at Corinth was struggling, and one of the themes that the Apostle Paul addressed that he wrote to them was working together. Um, let see if I can get my spot here. Verses 12, 13 there in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body belonging, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. 
For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink in that one Spirit. Well, that doesn't sound too complicated. The concept sounds simple enough. We're, we're, we're all of equal value regardless of our ethnic background, regardless of our family background, regardless of what physical attributes we have. You know, the church in Corinth in many ways was very diverse. You know, they had uh, slaves. They had wealthy people. Um, you know, maybe it was harder for the wealthier ones to rec recognize that everybody was equal because in that society there was very much of a kind of a top-down type of order. They also had Greek and Jewish members and talk about a difference there. Culturally, that was a major culture clash. But they all shared one common baptism. This is what makes them part of the body. The Holy Spirit dwelling inside. So if that church could be unified, any church can follow suit. So, so what is the ingredients for community? And Brother Ron read the scripture, and, and it just kind of jumps out the page to you, and that is love. Jesus makes it clear that first and foremost, how believers are to treat one another, as Brother Ron, Ron read in John 15, you know, we're to show love one to another. And we're supposed to follow Jesus' example in that. And remember we said the other night, Jesus calls us not just to love our friends, but our enemies. So if we have the capacity to love even our enemies, then certainly, how much more should we love the Church of Christ? And our brothers and sisters in the Lord should be the dearest people to us, aside from our biological family. And yet so often that's not the case. Some of the most hurtful, damaging conversations come out of the body of believers. Why is that? You know, in my line of work, we, we get into a number of congregations, and, and when I say congregations, I'm talking about mainline denominations, Methodists, Episcopal, Lutheran, you name it. And it's amazing how much conflict there is in churches, and people resigning, and... Um, you know, we had a job meeting one time, and then somebody wasn't there. Well, where are they at? Well, they, they left the church because they got mad about this. Something happened with the, with the project. You know, love is, is not just a suggestion. Jesus repeats it twice in just a few verses that it's a commandment. You know, we start reciting all the reasons why we can't love our brothers and sisters. It starts revealing the true heart issues in our end. I can't love him. He said mean, hurtful things to me. Well, that means I'm holding a grudge. Or maybe I find her so abrasive and judgmental. Well, it could be that that person's on a journey of growth and needs to learn to be more God-honoring in their conduct. Doesn't mean they can't be loved. And if I feel like that's, a still, if that's still a struggle for me to, to love that person, maybe it means I'm on a journey too. I need to be on a journey too. My favorite one is, though, that guy is just so different. Let me remind you that in God's eyes, diversity is not by accident. It is the point. God put that person you consider out of the mainstream in your life, in your congregation, on purpose. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit when we talk, as we talk about spiritual gifts. The second attribute of a healthy church community is value. And I'm going to look at 1 Corinthians 12 and focus on verses 15 to 26. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, it is therefore not of the body? Question mark. And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole body were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now they are, are they many members, yet but one body? And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more, those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. 
and the members of the body which we think to be less honorable upon those we bestow more abundant honor and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness for our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacketh, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. And I'm going to pause there. Apostle Paul covers it pretty well, I think, in that. He says, you know, they're all, even though each part of the body is different and some we kind of naturally gravitate to and some we kind of think need to be hidden and yet they're equally valuable because they're all needed you know we just can't start taking body parts out of our body and still function he talks about some are more naturally more attractive and others better to keep covered and how do you apply that to the church body are, are you is there certain members that we're just naturally attracted to? Now, I don't mean that physically, but there's certain gifts, you know. I don't know if, if, if you um, have heard of, ever hold the, heard of the sold-out youth conferences that came to our church a number of years back. It was hosted at our church, and, you know, um, just a bold speaker and, and, and people listening. Wow, that... that that speaker is just really good and connects well. And uh, but you know what? To have a conference or to have a, a crusade or even to call it, it takes a lot of background work, a lot of behind the scenes work. It takes a lot of organization. And so it isn't just one person. We tend to focus on one person, but it's a lot of people, a team working together. Uh, I think it was John Maxwell that said when he was early in his ministry that. He realized that he had, did not have the gift of administration, and he worked so hard and got so burnt out doing all these things that he wasn't good at doing. Um, it wasn't until he was able to bring others on board that were really gifted in that area that his ministry was able to, to uh, really be successful. Sometimes we as believers need to recognize that we can't do everything and we aren't everything, that we need others. The last attribute of a healthy body of believers is differing gifts being exercised. And I want to spend the majority of our time here this evening talking about this. Because it involves a more in-depth discussion of the seven spiritual gifts. And again, I don't mean to insult anyone that feels that they've done a deep dive on spiritual gifts. This is not to insult anyone's intelligence. I'm sure there's many of you that know. But I'm just going to highlight some of these. It's a good reminder for me. And, and this is not so much a, a, a seminar on spiritual gifts as it is us being able to recognize to give grace to each other as we're different. Your spiritual gift is not the same thing as your personality or your temperament. However, the, the two will often complement each other. At least I've observed that to be the case. For example, if you have the spiritual gift of administration, some, some, some men and women have... A, the gift of administration, and they're also a high D, if you know the DISC profile, the, the dominant personality. And some might say, wow, you're a, that man is a natural born leader. But not every leader has to be a D or have the gift of administration. God might call a leader with a gift of exhortation. You know, as Brother Ron said in the opening, you know, we're blessed in our ministry team to have many different spiritual gifts represented, and it's, it's just a joy to see each working together in their area of gifting and what they're able to accomplish. And I'm sure you have that here. So when God calls a leader that has the gift of exhortation, it looks different than it does when he calls someone with the gift of discernment or so on. So we're going to focus on seven motivational gifts tonight, not to be confused with the shorter list of manifestation or ministry gifts, and I... I'm using these terms. They're not original to me. Uh, actually, a number of years ago, I wrote a, read a book by Don and Katie Fortune titled Discover Your God-Given Gifts, and I want to give credit where credit is due. This is not original to me, but it's not original to them either. It's right out of the Bible. Um, and I will call the seven motivational gifts my word for it. It's your primary gift, and maybe that's not the right word to use, but God may manifest his work in you through other ways at his pleasure. He may use your gift for ministry purposes, 
or in other ways. But if you want a scriptural reference for the gifts we're going to look at, it's Romans 12, 6 to 8. And I'm not going to take the time to, to flip to that right now, but you can maybe put a bookmark in your Bible if you want to look at it more in depth. Romans 12, 6 to 8. So we're going to go through these tonight and, uh, again, not spend a tremendous amount of time on each one, but as we go through here, we're thinking about how these interact with each other and how we can work together as a team, as a body, rather than against each other. And the first one is discernment. And with the gift, and some call it prophecy, but it, the word prophecy gets a little confusing because that can be a manifestation gift. And so we're talking about discernment. With the gift of discernment comes the ability to clearly differentiate between right and wrong. This person tends to see things in black and white with little nuance. They're easily able to read a situation and determine who the players are and what's going on, what's being said that's important. In a business setting, they can determine who the true decision makers are, and it's not always the noisy ones. In a decision-making process, they're good at separating the noise and the innuendo from what really matters. They're not often manipulated or taken advantage of. In a spiritual setting, they, see in, they want to encourage the kind of repentance that produces a change of heart. And they want to observe the kind of fruit that a Christian bears as proof of heart change. They think we ought to be able to see, see it. John the Baptist was an example of a, of a biblical character who had the spiritual gift of discernment. In Matthew 3, 8, he challenges the scribes and the Pharisees who were hypocrites. Their actions didn't match what they professed, and he could see that. What he told them was to bring forth fruits, meat for repentance. So someone with the gift of discernment may not have a wide circle of friends and does not question their beliefs based on negative feedback they get from others. In a way, it kind of galvanizes them. They often speak boldly and they don't mince words. You'll not hear a wishy-washy word salad from this person. If anything, you might wince just a little bit. And you might think, ooh, that was a little harsh. Was that necessary? We might think of this as being a negative attribute, but when they are spirit-controlled, they can be very convincing because they're speaking from the basis of truth and they can be very persuasive. They're very open to, the, to being told their blind spots. They, they're willing to tell you your blind spots. They would expect you to do the same back to them. And sometimes we might accuse this person of being just a little bit too honest. This person speaks out of strong personal conviction and is also introspective, discerning what is their own heart. So sometimes when this person is not spirit-controlled, they can be judgmental or overly negative. They might inadvertently tear people down and fail to recognize incremental change. And, and as, if I'm honest, this is me. Uh, this is definitely my spiritual gift is discernment. And so I need to be careful. Sometimes change is incremental and I need to be, have patience and grace with others like I would hope they would have with me. And I find that it's interesting God put someone in my life, my wife, who has the gift of mercy in many ways we're the opposite in that regard, and yet in many ways we balance each other out as well. Lastly, they might struggle with self-image or discouragement because in their honest assessment of themselves, they realize they don't measure up to their own standards. So one thing that someone with the gift of discernment needs to understand is that as good as they are at reading people in situations, they can't read people's minds. We can't read people's minds. And so if you, like me, have the gift of discernment, don't ever let the words, you're just saying that because, don't ever let those words leave your lips because we don't know why they're saying that. We can't read their minds. Second one is the server. King James uses the word ministry. Many newer versions use the word service. And again, the word ministry, nothing wrong with that. It's just that it gets a little confusing. Uh, we're not talking necessarily about ministers. <clears throat> and um, this person is gifted at serving. This person can recognize practical, physical needs and knows just how to address them. There are times when a, at church maybe we'll have a fellowship meal and maybe the event's winding down and 
I'm standing around talking to some other brothers or sisters, and out of the corner of my eye, I see someone rolling up a table and putting chairs away and sweeping the floor up, and I think, boy, what, was I sleeping here? What happened? I should have been, I should be doing that. But that's natural for a server. They just recognize a need. They just go to it. Servers are the ones that head up volunteer work trips and clean up projects. For those who have suffered some kind of disaster, they show up when the church needs cleaned or when the mulching needs done or any other project needs done to there. You know, sometimes in our Plain communities, we take this for granted because this is just kind of part of our culture. We all kind of pitch in and do things. But a server has a special gifting from God. It isn't just part of their culture. This is, this is their gifting from God. VS projects, baking meals for people, this is just what they do. And if it were up to people like me, so much of this would just go undone because I don't always see the need. And, I, and then I see someone with the gift of service doing it, and I think, ah, oh, of course. Why didn't I think of that? They tend to be organized and efficient. They have things worked down to a science. And I think of the year that Gloria and I spent serving with the deacons in our church. And, you know, our deacons, I'm sure your deacons here, they have things worked out to a science when it comes to love feast and preparation and bread baking and and some of the other things. They, They have things figured out. Servers enjoy showing hospitality to everyone, even strangers. You know, the, the time or two that I was in charge of revivals recently and we have the sign-up sheet like you do for meals and snacks for evangelists, you know, the servers, they just jump right. And actually, the time that I did it, there was a server that said, hey, I haven't seen the sign-up sheet yet. I want to sign up for Wednesday night. Servers can get overburdened and care more for others than they do for themselves. The ones that I know tend to focus on short or medium term needs, jobs they can see through to completion. They aren't necessarily the visionaries that plant a seed that others see to fruition. It's it's, it's more shorter term things. They want to get project to get done and move on to the next one. They need to feel recognized to be appreciated. They become frustrated when they they feel like they're working alone and that others aren't contributing enough. And I I worked uh, in a school board with a Christian school. Uh, I served on a board with a man who was gifted with service. And, you know, he would, we would have work, volunteer work days, and I, I would show up at like 7.30, and I was thinking, man, I'm doing pretty good here, getting at 7.30. And he'd been there since 5.30 or 6 o'clock uh, working, and long after everybody else was gone, he was there. And sometimes he would get frustrated because he didn't see others serving with the same intensity that he had. They like things organized. They don't like clutter and they don't like chaos. One of the servers that I know had this phrase, he'd look around if things got a little shabby and he'd say, we need to establish some law and order around here. Unlike an administrator, they don't delegate work. They just do it themselves. Servers aren't always the highest profile people, but they're supporting the ones that are. Ironically, servers find it hardest to be served by others. They feel guilty like they should be the ones doing the work. And they can feel very hurt when their hard work or or ingenuity goes seemingly unappreciated or unnoticed. The classic server in the New Testament is Martha. Think about Martha. She was so hardworking and so industrious, not for credit, she genuinely cared for people, but it made her so frustrated to see Mary sitting there idle when there was real work to be done. We have Mary and Martha situations in the church today, don't we? The next one is a teacher. Teacher presents truth in a logical, systematic way. And that's a quote taken from right out of a book. This happens to be my secondary gift, and there's times when someone will ask me a question, and I'm excited. I'm like, pick me, pick me. Um, because I know the answer. But, but maybe it's not something that's, that's really easily communicated with a, with, a, with a single sentence. And I feel like I need to lay the groundwork first. And sometimes I legitimately wish I have a, a whiteboard right here. I could just sketch some things out and do some arrows and we could show you what this looks like. A teacher can always tell 
when you say you understand, but you don't really understand. A teacher loves to study and loves to do research. They always back up their facts. And when, the, when a teacher says they've done research, they don't mean they Googled it for a few minutes online. They did some real research. They will spend hours just researching a word, what the etymology is, how it's supposed to be used in a context. Don't ever make the mistake of taking a scripture out of context with a teacher or doing shabby research when there's teachers in the audience. I always try to watch my pronunciation of certain words because I know there's a teacher somewhere that's ugh, just like fingernails grinding down a chalkboard uh, if I mispronounce it. You know, I heard a teacher say one time that when preachers say the original Greek word for this meant, but half the time that's not even right. So I try to be careful with that too. You know, teachers want to get it right. They want to others. They want others to better themselves by getting it right too. And so, if a speaker mentions some obscure literary reference, it's the teachers that get it. Most other folks won't know what he said, but teachers are led by their intellect. They always want to break things down in applicable scripture principles. I want to say something else about teachers. Any number of people can stand up in front of people and, and fill time with words, but a gifted teacher, they just hard to get started and you're like, wait, the, the first bell just rang. How'd that happen? I just, we just got started. But a gifted teacher will draw you in and get you thinking about it, get you excited about what they're saying. You know, teachers, it might be challenging to convince a teacher that they have blind spots. I was in a situation with a very gifted teacher not that long ago. Again, someone you wouldn't know, a situation that you're not part of. And um, there were a number of people trying to show this dear brother how he had caused an offense. But he had so many well-reasoned explanations why that couldn't possibly be true. At one point, he became almost exasperated. He said something to the effect of, perhaps I should explain this a different way. It's hard for a teacher to accept that sometimes people will see things differently. More flowcharts and PowerPoints aren't what it's going to take to be of one mind. Apollos as well as Aquila and Priscilla were teachers in the New Testament. Exhortation, exhorter. We might call this person an encourager. They love to build people up. When a young person gives their first Wednesday evening lesson or helps out with Bible school by giving a devotional, it's the encourager who can't wait to talk up to them afterwards and say, great job, brother. And for a young man or young woman who's done something new, um, that means a lot. And what the encourager says is always genuine. They don't just say things just to say it. They believe it. The exhorter is the one who always remembers to send a note to a grieving person and doesn't forget it's your birthday today. Encouragers can teach also, only it sounds different than when a teacher teaches. An encourager is all about the lesson application, not about what the words mean in the ancient Hebrew. They may or may not put things in proper context. They have specific steps to follow in a lesson and applications that involve working with other people. Exhorters understand scriptural principles intuitively, and sometimes exhorters need to be careful that they don't lay out things they understand and then quick try to find scripture verses to back it up. The exhorters are the communicators, the counselors, and they love people. So in many ways of the inverse, if you're, if you're paying attention, each one of these gifts kind of has like an inverse. And so, you know, discernment and mercy, and now we have uh, teachers and exhorters. 
Um, we have servers and we have administrators. Each one has an inverse. Exhorters are often non-judgmental. They realize that we're all on a journey. We all have struggles. And that doesn't disqualify us from being a Christian. So in that way, they would have some tension with a brother or sister with a gift of discernment. They're a glass, glass half full kind of person. They make decisions easily, and it's often intuitive, not scientific. The idea that there might be a misunderstanding or conflict between themselves and others weighs them down. And they want to clear up anything, any misunderstandings as quickly as possible. They're full of ideas. Sometimes they literally do like to hear themselves talk. It happens to be how they process information. They, they get so excited in conversations that they maybe sometimes cut somebody off. They're so eager to help someone understand their problem. Sometimes exhorters struggle with talking too much, especially about others in areas that's best kept confidential. If we want to look at a scriptural example of a, of a person who's an exhorter, we think of Barnabas in the classic New Testament example. Next we have the giver, and the giver is the most subtle. The person who's blessed with the spiritual gift of giving is committed to giving the Lord's work. For every example that you know of, there's ten others that you don't know about. They aren't motivated by having their name on a stained glass window or having a wing named after them. A giver quietly steps in behind the scenes and makes things happen. They want to feel part of a ministry by giving to that ministry and making sure the money is spent wisely. They want to make sure the organization is practicing good stewardship. They handle their finances with utmost discernment, and they believe in doing their due diligence on ministries that they give toward. A man or woman who is spirit-led in the area of, of giving often hears the words, we are praying for that need. As a, as a former board member, as I mentioned, of a Christian school, I know of many instances that nobody else knows about of a giver coming in and making an anonymous donation of a considerable amount of money. And, and like I said, many times those large donations were anonymous. I mean, there were some that knew who it was, but they didn't want anybody else to find out. This person believes in tithes and offerings and also believes that money isn't the only way to give. Giving of one's time is also a tithe. Many of the men that I know are givers or good stewards with the resources that God has given them in business and know how to manage finances. For young couples starting out, trying to figure out how to do a budget or whether they should borrow money or some, for something or simply save up for a rainy day, this is the brother that I would, I would have them talk to. They're happy to mentor people in this way. Givers are men and women full of wisdom who have a servant's heart, a humble spirit. You know, a spirit-controlled giver can be used in a great way by God. A giver, especially one who's not spiritually mature, may struggle attaching strings to what's given. <coughs> I mean, they want to give money, but only if it's used this, this, and this, and this. A New Testament example of a giver is a woman named Lydia that we read about in Acts 16, and I won't take the time to read that, but you can read that later. Then we have administrators. When I think of an administrator, I think of someone who is naturally gifted with the ability to be organized. I've always wished that I could be more organized, and I try to be. Um, I'm on a journey there, too, but an administrator is just naturally organized. All of us, if we put forth effort, can be more organized in the sense that we can clean up our room or clean out our desk or create a filing system. But an administrator just thinks that way. Many of us need to be trained to be organized, but usually it's an administrator that's the one doing the training for us. The other thing I noticed about administrator is they get things done. They just know how to get things done. And we've been blessed with several administrators on our ministry team. And, and I think of those of you that are my age, remember that game Tetris, that little computer game with little shapes and stuff. And, Someone who's a minister, they just, they just naturally know how to make those things fit. And sometimes those of us that aren't gifted that way, we get overwhelmed with all these things we have to do and how are we going to get done. And the ministry just says, oh, you know what? 
I'm going to take care of that right now. That's only going to take a few minutes, and we'll just do that here, and then we'll do this other thing over here, and after a while, it's all done. When you give an administrator a job, they don't forget. They don't need reminding a month later. They are clear communicators. They handle authority well. An administrator will not usurp leadership. When they're asked to lead, they'll lead. In a void or vacuum of leadership, they'll step in and people will wonder, how, how do we ever do without the, this person? So whereas a gift, the person with a gift of service like short-term things that they can see from start to finish, an administrator um, likes long-term planning and long-term projects. They tend to be visionaries. They know how to get an organization from where they are now to where they want to be. They delegate tasks well. They don't feel like they need to do everything themselves. They're good at equipping other people for things. They have enthusiasm for what they're doing and they don't get overwhelmed easily. And again, unlike the one with the gift of service, they don't mind when they aren't recognized and they're more than willing to give someone else the credit for what they've done. The administrators that I know, especially the ones in leadership, can handle a certain amount of <clears throat> criticism because they have confidence in what they're doing. Administrators love people. They gain energy working around people, and especially in high-functioning teams. They don't enjoy menial or repetitive tasks. They sometimes struggle when others can't catch the vision that they have. Sometimes they become so accustomed to criticism that they become indifferent to it. Men who are not spirit-controlled may sometimes neglect home responsibilities <clears throat> due to an oversized workload because they're busy, so busy focusing on the job they're doing that they, they, they kind of neglect other things. But, you know, if we want to look for a, for a biblical example of an administrator, uh, think back, back to the Old Testament, Joseph. Wasn't Joseph with, blessed with administration? I mean, he ended up running the country, literally, until it was all said and done. And the last one is compassion or mercy. And so, as I said before, it's, this is kind of the inverse of discernment. This person loves people and will show love to them in a way that only they can. They always want to see the good in people. They see all the redeeming qualities, no matter how negative the person might be. And they're, they're literally attracted to people in need. Unlike the server who may focus on physical needs, the one with the gift of compassion or mercy is focused on emotional and spiritual needs of people. They are careful with their words to avoid offense. And unlike the gift of discernment, which can be blunt at times, you know, that someone with the gift of mercy or compassion is a safe place, is a safe person to talk to. They won't go saying thing, things they shouldn't say. They honor people. They don't like conflict. They don't like tension. They tend to be guided by emotion rather than reason. One negative attribute is that they can have the tendency to pick up offenses of others. And they're easily hurt by others. If you want to think of a biblical example of someone with the gift of mercy or compassion, that would be Ruth. You know, wouldn't it have been much easier for Ruth to stay in her own homeland? She could have easily turned around and <clears throat> when she was told to go, go, but she didn't. And as I keep on saying, each one of these gifts you'll recognize has someone else, the inverse, someone else that balances you and I out. And this is the person that you need to have in the body. This is the person that I need to have in the body to make it work. And yet, these are the people that rub us wrong. This is the one that gets in your way or bugs you. Maybe you even feel righteously indignant to this person. You know, this diversity is not by accident. It was the whole point. A body of believers has the ability to be the most amazing, nurturing organization imaginable. 
At the same time, it can be a place where people are torn down and wounded, and people can end up with scars. So how we exercise our spiritual gifts matters. How spirit-controlled are we? And the more spirit-controlled we are, the better this is going to go, the better this is going to work, and the more edification will be brought to the body and to the body of Christ. So let's not ignore the spiritual element to spiritual gifts. These are, again, these are not just personality traits. These are gifts from God. You know, the church is designed to be a place where you all belong. We're all family. We all have a connected sense of community. And my prayer tonight is that we do that well. And as I look at my life, I recognize I can do a better job. I shared before, you know, I think God knew what he was doing when he put a man with the gift of discernment and a woman with the gift of mercy together. And I think it has made us stronger as a couple, and I think it makes us stronger as a church. We're going to stop here tonight for, for this evening. Um, i going to give another invitation tonight. As we think about this topic, we certainly want to be open to leading the Spirit if there's ones here tonight that have been feeling the Spirit tugging at their hearts all week and just haven't had the courage to stand, we, we encourage you to do that. If you want to be part of this body, we, we want to give you this space to do that, and we ask you to stand. And maybe tonight uh, you have made a commitment, but you realize that there's been some tension. There's been some things that you've said or done, or maybe others have said or done to you that were not Spirit-controlled, and you want to ask forgiveness or you want to make take the first step to make amends we're going to give you the chance to uh, stand or raise your hand whatever you feel comfortable with as well so I'm going to ask brother lead two verses of a song as we sing uh, may the spirit lead us what shall we sing 65 
Um, we're also going to have a children's story as well. So children, look forward to having that tomorrow night as well. Um, as, we, as we stand for closing prayer, I see Brother Glenn Miller out there. Glenn, if you head up here and have a closing prayer, we'll uh, remain standing after prayer for a final song. Heavenly Father, we're thankful that we could gather together in thy holy name tonight. Thank you, Lord, that Jesus said where two or three are gathered together, there will I be in the midst. And Lord, there's many more than that here. So we thank you, Lord, for your presence, for being here, for blessing us, for the word, for the church. Oh, God, that every part would be alive and working and, and active and ambitious for your kingdom, but there would be no part neglected, there would be no ministry, no needful thing ignored, Father, in the body of Christ. Help us here, at Lord, Lord, at Pleasant Hill to love one another, help us to encourage one another, help us, Father, to appreciate one another, and Lord, help us to spur each other on in our faith. Lord, bless Brother Dustin for his faithfulness to your word, in your word tonight and throughout the week. We pray for your continued blessing, Lord, as he continues to serve. Pray for safety as he travels. Pray for his family, Lord, watch over and care for their needs this week. And I pray, Lord, that in the name of Jesus, Satan would not be able to cause confusion this week, but that all would go well. Bless each one, Lord, in this place. Lord, you know our undoneness, you know our weaknesses, you know where we struggle, you know, Lord, where we need to improve. And we pray, Father, for your Spirit's work in our lives. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Green Hymnal number 112. 112. We'll sing verses 1 and 4. Oh, so. I need to be filled with the Spirit. 